Hello, everybody. Welcome to Strategy in Future. This is Jacek Bartoszek, and with me uh, from my team is Marek Budzic and Ritman Bariur Kosta. And today, the special guest, Andrei Kortonov, a p- p- prominent expert, uh, Russian expert on geopolitics, international relations uh, from uh, the, the, the Russian Foreign Affairs Council uh, and uh, many other bodies. And he's a, a world known expert uh, uh, that writes to multiple uh, papers. Uh, I could uh, talk uh, for one hour at least about the achievements of our guests, <laughs> but let me let me just uh, say hello. Hello. Mm. Okay, so how do you feel these days when we talk in November, at the end of November 2020, in the midst of the pandemic, in the midst uh, apparently of the global, a major global shift of power, uh, you know, and given the fact that you are right now in Moscow, in the middle of Eurasia, between China and the Atlantic world, but uh, in the middle of, your, of you know, those two powers that are about maybe to confront, uh, how do you feel these days? Well, I feel concerned. And uh, of course, there are many reasons uh, to be concerned, uh, uh, many problems uh, to be concerned about. Uh, I think that uh, definitely, uh, you know, this uh, crisis and uh, the crisis that we experience this year is not limited uh, to the pandemic only. It is uh, definitely more general. Uh, we uh, see uh, an economic recession, which is significant. You know, the recovery is likely to be slow. Uh, we also see a major uh, change uh, in the energy prices for Russia. Uh, let's say oil prices, gas prices are quite important. Uh, on top of that, of course, uh, we observe instability in many parts of the world, especially in Eurasia that you mentioned. And uh, for us, if you take uh, <clears throat> the Kremlin uh, and their assumptions uh, about the present and the future, of course, uh, the year started uh, with uh, a clash in Syria uh, in Idlib, uh, uh, Russia uh, nearly engaged itself into a direct uh, confrontation with Turkey. Uh, and uh, the year is ending uh, with another conflict uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh, which is even more serious for Russia because uh, it is uh, literally the Russian backyard, South Caucasus, which is closely connected to North Caucasus, which is a part of uh, Russia proper. Uh, so I'm concerned about the future. I think that we have entered a relatively long period of deglobalization, uh, and we are likely to see many manifestations of these uh, uh, trends. Uh, uh, well, uh, the results uh, of uh, presidential elections in the United States uh, might be confident for liberals. Uh, but uh, clearly the United States remains uh, uh, in a very deep uh, social uh, crisis. The country is uh, divided, uh, if not fragmented. Uh, I don't think that we count on uh, the United States as uh, a global leader for at least next couple of years. Uh, The country has to go through a very serious readjustment, uh, first of all, domestically. Uh, The future of the European uh, Union is still unclear. Uh, We might see a new wave of populism, not necessarily the right populism, maybe also the left populism in Europe. And definitely many of the problems that uh, Europe uh, had uh, to face uh, over the last 10 years uh, are not uh, resolved, but uh, only postponed. Uh, Definitely there are issues uh, related uh, to the you know, fiscal policies uh, and uh, the uh, ramifications, uh, 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 repercussions uh, of uh, the Brexit process, which is very complex and uh, painful for both sides. Uh, so the world uh, is uh, in, in uh, I wouldn't call it that, I would say that uh, we have no reasons to be optimistic, but uh, if we uh, try, to, uh, try to take a realistic approach uh, to the world, we should be concerned. And here comes uh, here come two questions that I have regarding Russia. Was uh, 
Were the Russians uh, seeing that coming? Were Russia be getting prepared? Was Russia getting prepared for this uh, change in the world system? And is Russia ready today to face the turbulent times? Well, of course, uh, if you talk uh, to people in the Kremlin or close to the Kremlin, they would probably tell you that uh, <clears throat> we knew that that was coming. Uh, and uh, therefore, Russia was trying to get prepared uh, to the world where the name of the game uh, is... Uh, uh, not uh, development, but rather security, not prosperity, but rather survival. Uh, and uh, Putin uh, uh, turned out uh, to be a politician uh, who understood uh, these developments and uh, who was trying to uh, get uh, his country uh, ready to face this challenge. Uh, some would say that, uh, uh, of course, uh, the... Um, the, the system that was created uh, uh, in Russia has its uh, clear deficiencies, but uh, in terms of uh, these uh, uh, future uh, challenges uh, and tests that uh, all of us have to go through, uh, Russia might be in a somewhat better position than uh, other countries, especially liberal democracies. Uh, a Putin supporter uh, would argue uh, that uh, uh, Russia has uh, significant comparative advantages in dealing with these multiple challenges uh, because uh, uh, it uh, doesn't have uh, a full-fledged system of checks and balances. Uh, it uh, can uh, make decisions uh, fast enough. Uh, it can mobilize resources when it is needed. Uh, it can provide uh, for a continuity in foreign policy, uh, which becomes uh, a value right now when uh, many other nations uh, cannot uh, afford a consistent foreign policy uh, due to the uh, uh, specific features of their political systems. Uh, Russia uh, uh, can uh, be very efficient in terms of personal diplomacy. Uh, it uh, can... Uh, afford the luxury of what uh, some would call uh, moral relativity. It can deal with uh, uh, many players that uh, other uh, uh, global powers are not able or not willing to engage. So there are certain number, a certain number of comparative advantages that Russia can use uh, when the international system is so volatile and so unstable. Uh, and uh, this is true. I think at least it is partially true. Uh, but uh, at the same time, you know, my personal take is that Russia has a fundamental problem. Uh, the set of tools that it can use uh, in its foreign policy is quite limited. Uh, you know, Russia, of course, uh, is a prompt member to the United Nations Security Council with uh, veto powers. It's important. Uh, it uh, participates in a number of uh, important international institutions and arguably even has uh, leading positions in some of them. Uh, Russia uh, has uh, uh, quite impressive uh, power projection capabilities and uh, its experience in Syria and later in Libya suggests that uh, you know, these uh, uh, capabilities are usable. Uh, that uh, they can make a difference. Uh, uh, Russia is a major player in uh, some of uh, important global markets, uh, like uh, like the energy uh, global market of energy and hyd hydrocarbons, or you know the uh, the the, f the global uh, food market. Russia is a major exporter of uh, food. It's a major exporter of arms. Uh, so it does have certain advantages, uh, even in the global economy. But still, uh, and let me repeat it, I think that the number of tools that uh, Russia can utilize uh, uh, in its foreign policy is limited. Uh, Russia is not really great in its soft power. Uh, Russia is lagging behind uh, uh, in uh, many modern manifestations uh, of uh, state power. And definitely... Uh, uh, if uh, uh, the current momentum changes, 
uh, if the world is beyond this current uh, trend towards deglobalization, towards instability and chaos, Russia might have a serious problem. Uh, how to uh, uh, survive and how to prosper uh, in the world of uh, globalization 2.0. This globalization, in my view, will come. It's just a matter of time. It might take five years, it might take uh, 10 years, uh, but uh, I don't think that you can stop or reverse globalization. Historically, I think it is uh, unavoidable, whether you like it or not. And uh, if it is the case, uh, it means that Russia, like any other nation, uh, should uh, get ready to face uh, this uh, uh, new cycle of history. Uh, and I don't know to what extent uh, this is something they think about in the Kremlin, uh, because uh, uh, this uh, requires a strategic vision, long-term planning. Mm, you know, Putin is known uh, for his skills uh, uh, as a tactic. I think that uh, he is probably uh, less uh, advanced in strategy, at least many people here in Moscow think that uh, he's a better tactician than a strategist. Uh, if it is uh, the case, then we have a problem and uh, we have to approach the problem. The sooner we do it, the better it is. Uh, let me ask you, Mr. Professor, one question. Uh, one of the latest articles you, you wrote that the, 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 the result of coming uh, Joe Biden to power will be uh, uh, consolidation of American alliance system, especially in Europe and maybe in Asia also. And that the result of this, uh, this trend uh, from the Russian perspective is that Russia could be pushed into the Chinese camp and then be part of the crushing zone, as you, as you name it, or the alternative is signing a kind of a new breast peace especially this this terminology breast peace is uh, uh, sounds interesting could you elaborate this idea what what does it mean in your opinion well uh, you know if you take the biden administration uh, i think that uh, it brings uh, certain opportunities and certain challenges to everybody uh, including russia of course uh, uh, in terms of the general Russian narrative, I think uh, Trump was very convenient uh, because uh, he was a very graphic uh, uh, evidence uh, uh, for the defense, for the defense of the Russian, official Russian vision of the world. And Biden and, uh, and uh, well, let me say that Trump and Putin had many things uh, in common, <clears throat> incidentally, together with uh, a number of uh, Polish leaders. Uh, you take uh, Putin and uh, Trump, uh, both uh, are nationalistic, uh, both are skeptical of uh, multilateral organizations and multilateral diplomacy. They prefer the unilateralist approaches. Uh, both are uh, transactionalists. Uh, neither uh, Putin nor Trump uh, are ready to spend a lot of time talking about values, about general principles, uh, but uh, it's, uh, they are very pragmatic in their own way. Uh, Biden is different. I think that uh, he has a different value system. He has a different vision of the world, a different vision of where the international system is uh, uh, developing. Uh, and I think uh, definitely you know, he is not a fan of Putin, so he will not shy to be very critical of the Russian leader. Uh, so in certain sense, uh, he is uh, uh, not uh, a partner of convenience. Uh, he's an adversary to deal with, uh, but uh, he is not a partner like Trump was. Uh, and uh, it doesn't mean that uh, Biden uh, will not offer certain opportunities uh, to Russia, I think if you take arms control, definitely Biden is more serious about arms control than uh, Trump was. He's likely to extend the New START agreement. Uh, he might uh, de facto abide by the provisions of the INF Treaty, though it's impossible to resurrect this treaty from the grave. 
there are some other opportunities, maybe in the Middle East, uh, maybe on climate change, where Russia and the United States uh, might work under Biden better than under Trump. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, I think that the pressure on Russia will increase under Biden. We will see more sanctions. And uh, as, as you rightly pointed out, uh, we might see uh, an attempt to restore uh, the transatlantic uh, alliance. Uh, again, <clears throat> not everybody in Europe, you know it better than I do, no, not everybody in Europe uh, supported Biden, but most of Europeans do support Biden. Uh, and uh, though it's impossible to get back to the glorious days of Barack Obama or Bill Clinton, uh, but uh, definitely uh, uh, these attempts to restore the transatlantic partnership can be at least partially uh, successful. Uh, so uh, it will put uh, Russia into a difficult situation uh, because uh, it will limit uh, the space for maneuvering and uh, it will reduce the incentives for the European Union uh, to reach out to Moscow. Uh, after all, many Europeans uh, were so eager to have a dialogue with Putin because they didn't trust Trump uh, and uh, they didn't have a lot of choices. Uh, but right now with Biden, probably this uh, incentive to make bridges to Moscow will go down, especially I think in Germany especially if uh, there is a new chancellor, maybe in Germany they'll have uh, a green chancellor uh, and greens have always been very critical of Russia. Uh, and uh, if you take, for example, Nord Stream 2, I doubt very much that uh, greens will maintain uh, this uh, support uh, to the project uh, that we saw from uh, Angela Merkel. Uh, so, uh, it means that Russia will have uh, to make certain adjustments. Uh, and uh, the question is uh, uh, how far Russia can go uh, in uh, uh, adjusting itself to this new situation uh, uh, without uh, really provoking a, a kind of collapse of its uh, international commitments uh, and uh, uh, its uh, foreign policy accomplishments of recent years. Uh, I, uh, indeed, I wrote about the, the piece of Brest, uh, though, uh, of course, uh, these uh, parallels uh, uh, should not be taken literally. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, Russia might uh, decide to limit uh, its foreign policy ambitions and to focus more uh, on the domestic agenda. Uh, because no matter how successful you might be in your foreign policy, uh, if you do not uh, deal uh, with your burning social and economic problems at home, uh, foreign policy is not a substitute uh, uh, to the domestic agenda. It has never been and it will never be. So my personal take is that uh, Russia uh, should indeed uh, uh, reconsider the set of uh, its priorities. And uh, I still believe that uh, structural reforms in the Russian economy are indispensable. And uh, the sooner we get down to this reform agenda, the better it is. And this agenda, if implemented, uh, will uh, guide our foreign policy. Uh, because uh, when we talk about Europe, for example, I think that uh, the importance of Europe for Russia is going down and it will continue going down unless and until uh, Russia uh, tries uh, to reform its economy. If Russia tries to reform it in a serious way, not just through digitalization or other you know, technocratic means, uh, but uh, <coughs> if it <coughs> focuses on... Uh, on unleashing the, the creative potential of the Russian society, meaning that uh, making more emphasis on small business, on, uh, 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 on uh, new industries, on IT, on biotechnologies, on things like that, uh, it will definitely raise the importance of Europe as a foreign partner, because to some extent Europe is uh, indispensable as a source of new technologies, new business practices, 
uh, and new social models. Uh, here, I'm afraid that China cannot fully replace Europe, neither can any other Asian country gain. You know, it doesn't mean that we should uh, drop our cooperation with Beijing, uh, but uh, if you look at the structure of our economic relations uh, with China, you will see that uh, these relations, uh, uh, well, in most cases, they are limited to a small number of large and super large projects uh, between public companies. Uh, it's good, but that's not good enough if you're thinking about reforms. Very, again, very interesting. Yes, Marek, you wanted to continue. Yes. Uh, let me ask you one, one more question. So in the, for, for the last few weeks, uh, we observe in, in Russia a growing number of voices, especially in the expert society, that the, after 30 years of, uh, the, uh, of collapse of the Soviet Union, <laughs> that's the time to rethink anew the Moscow policy toward the, the, the countries which were uh, established uh, uh, a, a, as an effect of the process of collapsing the, 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 the Soviet Union. Just to uh, finish the policy of special zone of interest and, uh, and uh, choosing more pragmatic orientation and more, uh, in, uh, let's say, uh, in, uh, policy with main countries, not just to protect uh, uh, the, uh, the involvement or uh, uh, opposition of the Russian in all of these countries, but the, the main one. We are talking just now the day when Mr. Wavrov is in Belarus. Let me ask is this, uh, what in your opinion are the, uh, will be the results of this, uh, uh, this reflection? Is it really will mean the change of the policy of Moscow to the to the neighbor states and to, and one and and what in future will be the position of the Belarus in the uh, in the uh, Russia policy? Well, uh, first of all, I agree with you that there is a certain trend. Uh, there is a, a certain evolution of the Russian policy towards uh, its neighbors. And uh, we can uh, speculate about the motivations of this change, uh, whether it's a learning curve in the Russian leadership or it's just deficit of resources or some other reasons. But I think that uh, generally speaking, uh, Russia, the Russian leadership is uh, less inclined uh, to get involved uh, into developments uh, along its borders. Uh, you take uh, four major developments that took place uh, uh, in the periphery uh, of the Russian Federation over the last uh, three or four months. And these are, of course, the political crisis in Belarus, uh, 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 change of the leadership uh, in uh, Kyrgyzstan, uh, the war uh, in South Caucasus, and finally elections in Moldova. And if you take all these four uh, important developments, uh, very different developments, there is no single pattern. Uh, but if you look at the Russian reaction, I think that uh, in all the four cases, the Russian reaction was rather late uh, and rather reluctant. I think that <coughs> Moscow reluctantly supported Lukashenko. He tried uh, to avoid a direct involvement in the crisis in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, it uh, uh, get into the Nagorno-Karabakh war only when it became clear that uh, Armenia was clearly losing. Right? And uh, it didn't try at least on the large scale basis uh, to influence the outcome of elections in Moldova. I think uh, basically it's natural, and I think it's a recognition of the fact that uh, the, the time for rigid alliances is over, and uh, we will see. <coughs> Sorry. 
we will see more and more cases when um, small, medium-sized countries uh, are demonstrating flexibility in choosing their partners. And instead of rigid alliances of the 20th century type, we will see situational coalitions of nations. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We will see more tactical alliances and uh, what I would call, you know, project based partnerships. Uh, partnerships not around specific international structures, but rather around specific set of problems. Uh, that uh, coalitions of the willing will try to address. I think this is the future, and uh, we see it not just uh, uh, with Russia, we see it uh, in many other cases. Even if you take NATO, uh, Turkey is uh, a member to NATO, but uh, this membership uh, does not set any serious limits on the Turkish behavior uh, in uh, its immediate environment. So we see an erosion of uh, these uh, uh, alliances uh, uh, and uh, this uh, uh, rigid uh, uh, unions of states. Uh, and uh, we see more autonomy, if not uh, independence, uh, uh, exercised by uh, countries which uh, are trying to select uh, uh, their partners for every specific situation, every specific uh, problem, every specific foreign policy project. Uh, as far as Belarus is concerned, of course, it's very special because uh, uh, Belarus is arguably the most important uh, foreign policy partner of the Russian Federation. Uh, it's a gateway to Europe. Uh, it's an important uh, transit corridor, but also historically, culturally, it's uh, closer to Russia than any other post-Soviet space state. Uh, so I think Belarus remains very important. Uh, and uh, my take is that uh, right now the Russian leadership uh, acts uh, under assumption that uh, Lukashenko will be there for some time, though he has already um, become a lame duck, but uh, he will be there for some time. Uh, that the West will not really play a significant role in Belarus, neither the European Union nor NATO, maybe individual member states will try uh, to be active, but their capacities are limited. Uh, Moscow, or rather the Kremlin, uh, is clearly interested in an in-house transition, a transition from Lukashenko to someone younger, someone more energetic, better educated, a person who might have more charisma than Lukashenko, uh, but uh, who will not uh, disrupt uh, the uh, geopolitical landscape uh, of uh, Eastern Central Europe. It means that uh, Belarus might uh, become a different country in terms of the political regime, uh, but uh, it is not likely to uh, change uh, its uh, basic allegiances. I think in the Kremlin, they expect Belarus to stay within the Eurasian Economic Union, uh, to stay within the Union state with Russia, uh, to be a part of the uh, CSTO, this uh, Collective Security Treaty Organization, so to play by the rules, uh, so to say. Whether it is doable or not, it's hard to tell. It, a lot will depend on the resilience uh, of the political opposition in Belarus, on their ability to sustain the pressure that uh, is growing on them. Uh, I think that uh, it's hard uh, to imagine that uh, uh, Lukashenko can uh, bring the situation back uh, under his control. So for me, it's just a matter of time, uh, but uh, Maybe in the Kremlin, they have a, a different assessment of the situation and they believe that uh, Lukashenko can stay there not just for another couple of months, but for another couple of years. But in any case, uh, the political transition Belarus has already started and I don't think it can be stopped. Uh, it can be probably slowed down, maybe even frozen for a limited period of time, 
uh, but definitely uh, the country is changing and it will continue to change. So Russia will have to accept it uh, with all the dependence that uh, uh, we see. Belarus really depends on Russia in many various ways, but still, you know, it's a separate country, it's a separate nation. Uh, and uh, I don't think that uh, the, the Belarusian people will uh, accept uh, Lukashenko for too long, I think. His time has, has clearly gone. Yeah, and, and let me add some, w- mm-hmm. one more question, a, a little sh- a short one. Let me ask, is there any potential field of cooperation, uh, I mean Belarus, between uh, Russia and the West, as, uh, as for example, Mr. Bild proposed in, in his well-known uh, article? Is this uh, uh, Russia open for this uh, idea or that's a question of the future? Well, I think that in theory, Russia is ready. Uh, but in practice, uh, I think uh, it will take some time. Uh, my take is that uh, uh, in the Kremlin, probably the, the plan is to uh, manage this transition in Belarus to assist the current leadership uh, to go through this uh, uh, political transition. I, I repeat, in-house political transition, not a transition which will imply Uh, free elections and uh, regime change, uh, but something that will make the regime uh, more acceptable to the population. Uh, So they would prefer clearly uh, this uh, managed transition uh, to a new leader, maybe even to a new system. Uh, And then when the transition happens, uh, definitely uh, they would suggest uh, uh, the European Union to work together on Belarus Uh, but uh, to to work together on the terms that the new Belarusian leadership will offer uh, to Europe, which will imply that, uh, you know, if the idea is uh, really to turn Belarus into a liberal democracy, uh, I don't think that uh, the current political establishment in Belarus, to the extent we can talk about political establishment there, uh, can accept uh, this idea. if things do not go beyond their control, uh, I think that uh, we will see a, a kind of, uh, you know, Lukashenko too, uh, someone more polished, uh, uh, more modern, uh, more charismatic than the old leader, uh, but uh, someone uh, who would try to avoid uh, a rapid political and social change, uh, which might uh, produce instability and uh, might uh, result uh, in a real serious uh, domestic political conflict. I think this is the idea. But, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I know Carl built fairly well and uh, I appreciate, uh, you know, his ideas. Uh, uh, I think that, I, again, ideally Belarus should become a bridge between Moscow and Brussels, uh, but, uh, Unfortunately, this relationship today is, uh, is uh, poisoned by many other problems. Uh, maybe the most uh, graphic manifestation of, this, uh, uh, of these problems is uh, the, the Navalny case and the way how it is interpreted uh, in Europe and in Russia. I think that uh, uh, it might uh, look as a relatively minor issue, but I think in terms of psychology, <laughs> attitudes, uh, perceptions of each other, it's a very big thing. Yeah, but just let me add uh, one more question uh, towards this Belarusian thing, a uh, case. Uh, you mentioned the gateway, the turmoil, the, the transition uh, within Belarus and the sort of a uh, reconsideration by Russians of their um, resources, so to speak, to, to, to service their foreign policy. And as you well know, for Poland, Belarus is also a a pivotal place, uh, but from the other side of the map. And so uh, given the, you know, the unknown future of this uh, piece of, 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 you know, of, of, uh, of the world, uh, where would be the red line the, for, for the Russian mental maps uh, that the Russians would cross uh, facing the, you know, the sort of uh, advancement, you know, you, you mentioned the breast of also peace agreement uh, advancements from the West, uh, be it from Poland, EU, or NATO, or transatlantic community, in terms of the Belarusian case, where will be the red lines drawn? 
Uh, well, it's hard to tell. I think that the red lines uh, uh, are uh, in uh, potential change of the uh, geopolitical allegiances of Belarus. I think that uh, what uh, the Kremlin cannot afford uh, is uh, Belarus uh, moving away from uh, Russia and its uh, multilateral integration uh, schemes in Eurasia. Uh, if uh, we see in theory, I don't think uh, we will see anything like that, but if we will see another Maidan uh, in, uh, in Belarus, uh, another revolution of dignity uh, with a very clear uh, intention uh, to break uh, uh, with Russia and uh, to move uh, uh, closer to Europe, including the European Union and NATO, uh, that might be the red line. And that might be uh, a kind of uh, justification, quote unquote, uh, for a Russian engagement. Uh, I think that uh, uh, provided uh, that uh, Belarus uh, stays where it is uh, geopolitically, the Kremlin can uh, tolerate uh, various uh, experiments uh, uh, in the domestic political system of Belarus. So the, the political system can become more pluralistic, it can become more open, <laughs> Uh, it uh, might uh, imply, for example, uh, independent judiciary or devolution of power. Uh, I think that uh, this is something that uh, uh, is not uh, behind the red line. But uh, if uh, the new leadership of Belarus uh, uh, decides to completely change uh, its geopolitical priorities, and if the European Union, for example, <clears throat> gives offers Belarus again, and we're of course speculated about very hypothetical scenarios, but if uh, Brussels uh, offers Belarus a fast track uh, to the European Union, I think that would be hard to swallow. Uh, not to mention, you know, potential <clears throat> native membership for Belarus. Again, you know, I don't think that uh, uh, it, is, it is likely to happen anytime soon. I don't think I will live long enough to see Belarus enter either the European Union or NATO, but uh, if it happens, I think that uh, might trigger uh, a harsh reaction uh, from Moscow. Uh, all the rest, uh, well, I think that uh, it might be acceptable, though uh, it might also be uh, challenging. For example, you know, if we imagine that uh, Belarus goes uh, through a fundamental political reform and social reform and economic reform, and it becomes a model market economy, uh, like you know another Poland, for example, uh, and uh, uh, it uh, turns out to be quite successful uh, on this uh, path, it would definitely represent an existential challenge uh, uh, to Russia, because you see a country uh, which is not that different uh, from yours. You see a country which uh, uh, shares a lot uh, of your cultural paradigm, so to say. And of course, many people in Russia would uh, ask themselves a simple question. If they were able to make it, why cannot we make it? So I think that for the political regime that we have in Russia today, that would be a very serious uh, challenge. But uh, uh, we're not there, and we are not likely to be there anytime soon. Uh, Belarus uh, will go along a very bumpy road, and uh, no matter how it turns out, uh, but things are likely to get worse there before they get better. So there will be at least a couple of uh, very difficult years. Uh, so as a role model, Belarus is not likely to emerge for, for many years uh, uh, to come. Uh, therefore, I think uh, uh, the Kremlin might be less concerned about these uh, long-term existential challenges that Belarus might ultimately uh, uh, offer, uh, but it is more concerned about the immediate transition 
And I think that uh, if you compare the moods uh, in Russia, in the Russian, in the Russian power structures uh, today with the moods uh, in summer, I think right now uh, there is more confidence that uh, uh, such a gradual, uh, such a managed transition in Belarus is possible. Because in summer, when the whole thing started, uh, I recall there were uh, uh, many uh, apocalyptic visions of what might happen in Belarus uh, if uh, Lukashenko is overthrown uh, tomorrow. Uh, many I, perceptions that uh, you know the, the country will will slide into chaos and uh, uh, it will uh, drop out of uh, the <clears throat> Russian range of Russian partners. Uh, I think today they're a little bit more confident that it will not happen, but uh, I wouldn't bet on what's going to happen in Belarus because uh, sometimes uh, major changes uh, start uh, uh, with very small uh, incidents. So we don't really know uh, how resilient the Lukashenko regime uh, still is. Uh, yes, they were able to keep control uh, over the country and uh, the so-called Siloviki, the, the power uh, law enforcement apparatus uh, stays loyal to Lukashenko at this juncture, but we don't know what will happen there tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. The situation remains profoundly unstable and uh, many surprises can happen. Dear Professor, I, I would like to ask a question until we are, let's say, in Eastern Europe. And for this question about another one, a friendly country uh, and the Russian borderland, I mean Ukraine. So when Zelensky became a president, it was real hope uh, in Moscow that something is going to change. But unfortunately, what I see for Moscow, what we see that uh, it's big disappointment. So we have some negotiations regarding Donbass, but at the same time, right, right now in Ukraine, really increasing cooperation, military cooperation, particularly with Great Britain, uh, with Turkey, and now initiating the Crimean platform. So what kind of future has uh, Russia regarding Ukraine? So is it she is going to, for instance, uh, frozen any uh, any cooperation with Ukraine, or would try to alter situation. Well, you are right uh, that uh, there were some expectations uh, related uh, to the election of uh, Vladimir Zelensky, uh, and uh, unfortunately. Uh, uh, most of these uh, expectations and uh, hopes. Uh, uh, did not come true, uh, and there are many reasons for that. Uh, I think that uh, there are certain limits on uh, what uh, any Ukrainian president can do uh, in trying to find some kind of uh, accommodation with Russia. Uh, maybe uh, Zelensky overestimated uh, his uh, abilities and uh, his uh, political power in Ukraine uh, to start with. Then he had to step back and even his own party is now uh, less disciplined than it was a year ago. Uh, so I think that if there was a window of opportunity, uh, let's say in spring of last year, you know, uh, today it is much smaller, it is still there. And the profound problem uh, of uh, the Donbass issue is that uh, no Ukrainian president can uh, implement the Minsk agreements in full. That's reality. Uh, the Minsk agreements uh, 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 are not popular in Ukraine. Uh, they are perceived uh, as something that was imposed on them. Uh, the perception is that uh, Petro Poroshenko basically, you know, uh, uh, didn't have the right uh, to sign these agreements uh, without at least consulting uh, the legislature. Uh, so it's not a document uh, that uh, Ukrainians are very happy about. And they have reasons uh, for uh, 
uh, for not being happy. And of course, you know, it's not fair to accuse Poroshenko uh, because basically when you have a, a gun headed at your at your head, you know, you, you, you have to make a compromise, you have to make concessions. So it's a difficult situation. And uh, of course, uh, if I were to advise the Russian leadership, I would say that, you know, we should demonstrate more flexibility uh, regarding the uh, sequence and uh, modalities of the Minsk agreements. We should uh, give Ukrainians more space. <clears throat> Uh, for example, you know, uh, in the Minsk agreements, uh, it is stated that a special status uh, for Donbass uh, should be an organic part of the Ukrainian constitution. But uh, you will not be able to, <clears throat> to pass such amendments to the Ukrainian constitution uh, in Verkhovna Rada. It's simply, it's not possible. You will not get the needed uh, number of, of uh, votes to support this idea. Uh, so there should be some other ways uh, to approach this issue. Uh, we can talk about uh, special uh, laws or, you know, we can uh, talk about uh, the, I think, very important process of uh, devolution of power, uh, which uh, takes place uh, in Ukraine. Maybe in the end of the day, uh, if it goes as it goes, uh, uh, we will not even need a special status for Donbass, because all regions of the country will have enough autonomy and enough independence uh, uh, to uh, protect their interests and protect interests of those who live there. Uh, but of course, you know, if you take uh, the Russian leadership, uh, if you put yourself into Putin's shoes, uh, you can ask yourself, you know, why should I make these concessions? Why should I uh, let Ukrainians uh, into the trap, uh, which they themselves uh, uh, got them too. Uh, so uh, I think that in order to move out of this deadlock, we also need to find something to incentivize the Russian leadership. And this something uh, cannot be found in the bilateral Russian-Ukrainian relations, because Zelensky can do only as much as he can do, uh, not more. Uh, so if we are looking for incentives, uh, these incentives uh, should be found uh, not in Kyiv, but in Brussels or in Berlin or in Paris, in Europe. And again, you know, I can understand uh, that uh, right now there is no appetite in Europe to make any proposals to Moscow. Nobody wants uh, to reward Putin for what has been done uh, with Ukraine. Uh, nobody wants uh, to make any additional uh, proposals uh, to the Kremlin, uh, but uh, unless uh, there is something that can uh, match this flexibility on the Russian side, I'm afraid that we will stay in this deadlock for a very long time. Now, when I think about <clears throat> what it means <clears throat> to offer Putin something, uh, my personal take that it should be something in the domain of the new European security architecture. Uh, again, my, that might sound a little bit uh, idealistic, but uh, I think that we should still consider opportunities for, for example, reinventing OECE uh, or maybe looking for some other uh, pan-European uh, security arrangements uh, beyond uh, the NATO Russia Council and uh, beyond the appropriate mechanisms of the European Union. Uh, and uh, my take is that uh, if we want to achieve progress on Ukraine, we should consider these uh, two tracks not as sequential, that you know, first we fix Ukraine, and then we get down to a broader European agenda, uh, but rather as parallel. We discuss Ukraine, uh, we discuss issues of Donbass, uh, and the potential Russian-Ukraine reconciliation in a broader sense, but at the same time, we discuss issues of uh, uh, future of Europe, uh, which uh, should generate a cap vision, uh, not only in the West, but also in the East of our continent. But do you think the Crimean issue is over, yes? <laughs> uh, well, I think that uh, uh, if there is no regime change in Russia, uh, it's not 
practical right now to, to raise it. Uh, but uh, uh, in the end of the day, uh, my take is that uh, you can imagine a situation uh, uh, similar to what's going on right now in South Caucasus. Uh, you can see, you know, Azerbaijan is using military power to recapture uh, territory uh, which uh, used to be a part of Azerbaijan and, uh, you know, then uh, uh, got separated from Azerbaijan. The problem that I see with Crimea is that it's not just uh, uh, Crimea drifting away from Ukraine, uh, uh, but it is also Ukraine drifting away from Crimea. Uh, for example, you know, if you take the uh, the, the recent... Uh, 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 legislation in Kyiv uh, on uh, on languages and uh, languages in education. They uh, now uh, transferred all the even the elementary schools into Ukrainian. Definitely, that will not uh, give them uh, a lot of points in Crimea. I don't think that anyone in Crimea, or at least the overwhelming majority of Crimeans, would not accept it. Uh, so I think the danger that Ukraine faces. Uh, not just in terms of uh, the uh, Crimean problem, but uh, more general sense, including Donbass, including some uh, regions uh, populated by national minorities, is that uh, it seems that uh, they have not yet dropped the idea of uh, uh, an uh, uh, ethnic nationalist state. And as long as they pursue this idea, uh, they are likely to lose uh, uh, people who otherwise uh, would be more inclined uh, to stay as Ukrainian citizens. So this is the problem. They have to go beyond it. Uh, and uh, if they do, who knows? You know, uh, history is full of uh, things that shouldn't have happened, but still did happen. So, uh, I, uh, but uh, again, you know, it's. I think it's not uh, something that can be resolved. Uh, 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 fast. I think that uh, it's much easier, uh, though it is not easy, but it is much easier to resolve the Donbass issue than to get back to the Crimean agenda. I think it will take more time. Unmute yourself. Yeah, sorry. At the beginning of our conversation, you were, you know, mentioning uh, China and uh, Russia being between the West and China. A few questions regarding this aspect. Do you think that the rise of China is inevitable? Do you think that the US and China are on a path to a major confrontation and this is inevitable too? And do you think that there might be a hot war between US and China and are the Russians getting prepared for such scenario? Uh, do you think that China may win altogether and it will be China that will be a center of the world. Are such hmm. thoughts being contemplated in, in Moscow? And then, is that going to change all geopolitics that we have known for the last 500 years? Do you have such debates in Moscow? Well, uh, let me touch upon uh, your many questions. First, uh, about the rise of China. Of course, uh, I'm not an expert on China, though I... Uh, go to China these days uh, more often than I go to Europe, or at least to Washington, D.C. Uh, but of course, uh, in, uh, in Russia, we have our own uh, community of uh, China skeptics who say, well, you know, this growth is not sustainable and uh, various problems uh, uh, are accumulating in China and China is moving to a major crisis. Uh, social crisis, economic crisis, financial crisis, you name it. Uh, but uh, I am I'm not an economist, uh, so probably I'm not in a position to judge about uh, how well these arguments are. Uh, but uh, what bothers me in this logic is that uh, they keep saying that for at least last for at least last uh, 20 years that China you know, exactly. is doomed. Uh, 
like you know they talk about that in Europe or in the United States that you know China China will collapse or it will implode or you know something bad will happen to China. However, uh, so far we we see China growing in a rather steady way. Maybe the uh, uh, the rate of growth is uh, is not uh, as high as it was 10 years ago, but still, you know, it uh, grows much faster than uh, any other uh, major nation in the world. Uh, so I wouldn't bet uh, on the Chinese implosion. Uh, I think that uh, there is clearly a potential for growth there. You know, every time you go to China, you'll see, you know, how vibrant, uh, how active. Uh, uh, how innovative uh, the country is. Uh, so if this is true, if China continues growing and the balance of powers in the world is shifting in its favor, uh, I think that uh, some clash between the United States and China is uh, unavoidable, not necessarily a military clash, uh, but uh, <coughs> this competition <coughs> uh, in uh, uh, in technology, in, uh, in uh, uh, regions around China, uh, this uh, uh, geopolitical competition arms race is likely to continue <laughs> because the United States is not ready. And I don't think it will be ready anytime soon to accept uh, that it is no longer number one, but only number two. Uh, does it mean that there'll be a war? Mm, I doubt that. I think that <coughs> okay. the price of a war is too high. <coughs> we can see still a war as a result of some miscalculation or inadvertent escalation or human error or a technical error, but I don't think that uh, either of the two countries uh, is ready to start a war, a large-scale war. Uh, but uh, uh, even without a war, uh, if uh, this uh, China-US bipolarity becomes more rigid, uh, we all have problems because we all have to choose sides. And uh, a bipolar world in the 21st century, in my view, would be a very antiquated, uh, very dated system, which we should try to avoid to the extent possible. Uh, the big issue for me personally, uh, as uh, I spent uh, uh, my best uh, professional year studying the United States and the US political system and how they uh, U.S. society operates, and uh, I have always been a strong believer in liberal values. I thought that uh, only uh, uh, in, a, in a liberal political system uh, you can generate creativity, you can move ahead innovations, uh, you can uh, lead uh, technological progress, uh, uh, you can open the creative potential of your people. Uh, but uh, what is interesting about China is that uh, it challenges this vision. And I recall five years ago, especially 10 years ago, many people, uh, even in, in Moscow, not to mention New York or LA or the Bay Area, uh, would say, okay, you know, Chinese uh, can steal some technologies from us. Uh, they can imitate what we are doing. Uh, they can probably replicate uh, some of our accomplishments, but they will never catch up with us uh, because uh, their political system sets very rigid constraints uh, on what they can do. So basically, there are no reasons to worry. When they get closer to our level, they will slow down and we will still have the edge. So that was the narrative. And I think that it was a compelling narrative. But today, uh, this uh, narrative uh, has been shattered. Uh, you look at artificial intelligence and you'll see that uh, China is uh, already ahead of the United States, not to mention Europe, not to mention Russia, uh, in terms of uh, 
artificial intelligence applications. And they did it without uh, changing the fundamentals of their political regime. On the contrary, uh, what we can see is uh, the China's political regime over the last couple of years has become much more rigid than it was. And I can tell you, you know, I go to China for many years and I can see that uh, definitely there are significant uh, changes away from the Western liberal model uh, that are taking place in China. So the question is, in the end of the day, uh, uh, whether the liberal system has, uh, you know, these uh, undisputable uh, comparative advantages that we all believed in, or we were wrong, and uh, political authoritarianism can offer something that uh, liberal democracies cannot. And if the latter is right, it should change uh, our vision of the world, our vision about uh, our own countries, about uh, the most efficient models for the 21st century. Of course, it will have also very serious impact on how we perceive the international system. Uh, because uh, if uh, this political and social model that we see in China has so much comparative advantages over the, so to, so to say, Western system, uh, it will call for very serious adjustments uh, in the international order as well. Uh, again, the, I don't want to rush to conclusions. I think that uh, the jury is still in session. Uh, and I think that uh, still uh, liberalism has its own uh, very significant advantages. Uh, by the way, you know, I uh, know many wealthy Chinese uh, uh, who would like to retire in uh, in Tuscany, but I don't uh, know a single wealthy Tuscanian who would like uh, to move to Shenzhen uh, for his retirement package. So, well, you know, lifestyles are all important. Uh, the quality of life in Europe is uh, clearly higher than that in China, uh, maybe even than that in the United States these days, uh, but uh, still uh, we don't know the answer. and. Uh, this is one of the issues which uh, bother me a lot because uh, it's fundamental. It's about our core values. And we should not uh, uh, take the, the ultimate victory of liberalism for granted. Yeah. And the last question, as we need to sort of uh, uh, draw to an end, uh, Poland. Okay. So basically where this is where we are based. So, and you mentioned at the beginning that it will be, it it will be probably more so of the survival, and less of prospering, uh, given the times that are upon us. Uh, so, how would you make sure that Poland survives in this new environment, in the changing, you know, in the changing world system, if you were running the the affairs of Poland? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, uh, I think that. Uh, Poland uh, uh, has accomplished a lot, and uh, it's definitely a success story if you take uh, last, uh, let's say, 30 or 40 years. Uh, there are not too many European countries that can claim uh, same success stories, but uh, Poland also demonstrates uh, limitations uh, of this uh, development trajectory, because uh, <clears throat> When our liberals talk about why Russia <clears throat> uh, became so anti-Western, uh, usually they say there are, there are two reasons for that. Uh, first of all, uh, Russia failed uh, to become a part of Europe. Russia failed to find some kind of accommodation with major European institutions like the European Union and uh, NATO. And second, Russia failed uh, to restructure its economy. It failed to create a robust middle class. Uh, it failed uh, to have a community of uh, uh, independent uh, small businesses, mid-sized businesses. Uh, and they didn't really perform great because of its uh, rent-seeking uh, energy-based economy. And if you agree with these assumptions that these were the reasons for Russia uh, become an anti-Western, <clears throat> anti-liberal, uh, then you should look at Poland. Because uh, Poland was successful exactly where Russia failed. 
it was successful in integrating itself into European institutions. And many would say that uh, within NATO and uh, within the European Union, uh, Poland even punches above its weight. It is very mm. well represented. It has a lot of clout. It has a lot of influence uh, in the decision making. So uh, there should be no doubts uh, about Poland, uh, Poland integrating uh, into uh, the European Union and NATO. Uh, likewise, uh, there should be no doubt uh, about the ability of Poland, uh, uh, <clears throat> starting with uh, Balcerowicz and further on, to, res to uh, reshape, reinvent, uh, uh, reconstruct its economy. And uh, in terms of uh, economic development rates, Poland uh, is at the top. And if you look at the right, at the recent <clears throat> crisis, basically, Poland performed. <coughs> much better than the European average. Still, uh, all these issues uh, notwithstanding, uh, we see a nationalistic backlash, backlash in Poland. We see illiberal trends <coughs> <coughs> in Poland, which gain power. We see this resentment uh, against European integration uh, against multilateralism, against Brussels. And uh, here you see Poland uh, tilting uh, towards uh, Trump uh, rather than towards uh, its uh, partners and neighbors in the European Union. And if it is the case, uh, even if uh, Poland, even Poland is not immune uh, to these uh, manifestations of uh, traditionalism, it is an important uh, uh, lesson uh, uh, for all of us, including Russia. Uh, it means that uh, uh, even you are so successful, even uh, if uh, you accomplished your goals, uh, even if you have become a part of the of a larger liberal community, uh, you cannot take it for granted. Uh, and in my opinion, you know, Poland will be, will be back uh, you know, we will see a political change in your country. You know, I'm less concerned about Poland than I am uh, about Russia, because in, in Poland uh, you have much strong institutions. And I think that the European identity in Poland is also much stronger than it is in Russia. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, I think that uh, the Polish uh, experience uh, uh, should be also... Uh, something that uh, should make us more, uh, more modest in our aspirations uh, and our projections about the future. In, again, you know, in, the, in the long run, I'm, I'm, I'm moderately optimistic about Poland. I think that uh, you know, Poland is a problem of survival, is not a problem for Poland. They often say that uh, uh, Poland is the, the smallest of great nations, but uh, it definitely cannot be compared, let's say, to Baltic states, because uh, in these countries uh, with migrations and the population, there is an issue of national survival. Uh, there is no such issue in Poland, of course. Uh, you might have your own demographic problems, but uh, uh, these are manageable. These are not issues of survival. But... Uh, I think that uh, uh, it will be a difficult time for all of us uh, in, in maybe different ways, but uh, all the nations will have to readjust themselves and uh, to find uh, a, a new approach to the world which is emerging. Uh, and we should distinguish between the short-term future of the globalization and longer-term future of the second wave of globalization, which many of us are not ready to confront. So uh, no easy answers to your questions, uh, but uh, I think that, uh, you know, we, we should do our best and we should stick to our principles and uh, we'll see what happens. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, thank my team as well. Our guest at Strategy in Future was Andrei Kortunov. Thank you again. Uh, stay tuned with us. Uh, see you soon.